So we have great pleasure in inviting the panelists, uh, Dr. Hemlata, uh, who is the director of uh, NIN National Institute of Nutrition, which is an important organization of the Indian, uh, Indian uh, ICMR. And uh, she's also currently the president of the Nutrition Society of India. She's an executive committee member of uh, FANS. And she's also the chairperson of the National Committee for International Union of Nutritional Sciences. And more than everything, she's also been the chairman of the recent guidelines that were brought out, uh, the nutrition guidelines that were brought out uh, by NIN. So welcome, madam. Then we have with us uh, Professor Sarang Dio, who's a professor of operations management at the in International Indian School of Business at Hyderabad. He is also the Deputy Dean, Faculty and Research Executive Director at the Max Institute of Healthcare Management. His, uh, his research mainly focuses on healthcare delivery systems and their impact on health outcomes, including the work on vaccine supply chains, ambulance diversion, and TB diagnostic pathways. He holds a PhD from uh, UCLA Anderson and MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. So welcome, Dr. Sarang. We also have with us Dr. Santosh Kumar Kraleti, who's a senior health uh, public health specialist he's a founder he's the founder and ceo of foot soldiers for health he's professor and associate dean at the school of healthcare rishi hood university he holds several honorary positions also welcome dr santosh uh, to this panel discussion and then we have with us uh, dr vikram uh, mr vikram brother he's a he's the founder of uh, nephro plus with the, which is uh, been founded with the aim of transforming healthcare in India. Vikram is, uh, before Nephroplus, he was a strategic consultant at McKinsey and Company in New Jersey and founded an internal consulting group at Abbott Laboratories. So he has a MBA, Master in Computer Sciences from University of Illinois and MBA from University of Chicago. So welcome, Mr. Vikram. Uh, we also have with us Dr. K. Sambasivaya, who is a a medical oncologist who was uh, graduated from Tirupati, did his uh, post graduation at Ames, New Delhi, and uh, did his uh, specialization in uh, oncology from Chennai. Uh, he's founded the, the cancer center at Swims Tirupati, and he was also the professor and head Tata Cancer Hospital at Varanasi. Currently, he's the professor and head of Tata Cancer Hospital at Varanasi. So, welcome, Dr. Sambasivaya. So, I'll invite Dr. Sham to join me here and probably we'll start off, uh, ask him to give a, uh, a brief overview of the journey of Idea Clinics and its, uh, and its uh, foray into, health, uh, into preventive healthcare because we are trying to focus in this panel discussion on what should be the direction for, for uh, you know, preventing uh, preventive healthcare in our, st in our country. Thank you, uh, thank you Rakesh. Uh, welcome all. Uh, so uh, what... Uh, uh, we, we are expecting the IT minister to join us shortly. But uh, briefly, let me explain what Idea Clinics is all about. So uh, we started Idea Clinics a uh, few years ago. Uh, the, we are into preventive healthcare space. So end of the day, uh, when you look at human life, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively, uh, our life expectancy is increasing, but however, Compared to the Western counterparts, uh, we are all we are exposed to premature deaths. Life expectancy is reduced by almost 10 years. So, Idea Clinic's motive is to help people live longer and also quality of life. We should, as long as we are alive, we should be healthy. So, the problem right now is healthcare is predominantly very reactive. We are damaging our organs, and it's hospital based. Hospital based is nothing but real estate based. With with changing times, with lot of technologies taking over, the future is more of technology replacing real estate. So it's more of proactive, preventive health. That is where the future is. In that context, I thought we'll have a panel of uh, experts, some from uh, you know uh, uh, people from nutrition side, people who are experts in management, uh, somebody who has. Uh, a lot of experience in cancer care, uh, somebody with entrepreneur skills, scaling up uh, you know, dialysis centers. And after all, we have uh, none other than Professor Rakesh Sai, 
We are proud that he belongs to Hyderabad. He is the president for RSSDI, the biggest research uh, society for study of diabetes in India. Uh, after, he is also a professor from Usmania. So under his uh, leadership, we are trying to talk about this uh, concept called how can we keep the nation healthy? Thank you. So I think, uh, Dr. Shah, I mean, uh, we all know that from the recent report of the ICMR in depth study that we have a huge burden of metabolic disorders and uh, non communicable disorders. We know that we have a burden of about uh, 100 million people having suffering from diabetes and uh, a larger number about 136 million people having pre diabetes and these people are the ones who are at very high risk of converting to diabetes and they also are at very high risk of having the cardiovascular complications of diabetes and we know that you know globally uh, while the conversion rates may be slightly lower in uh, globally but we have at least four times higher risk of these people converting i mean progressing to diabetes so it is a, it is important that we uh, address this issue and see that we are able to prevent them you know from developing diabetes otherwise the burden of diabetes is going to further increase and we know the burden of diabetes is because of its complications all the complications that are that happen because of diabetes the nephropathy the renal disease and the uh, the cardiovascular disease and retinopathy also we are going to discuss a little about that in the afternoon also so i think uh, you know the the aim therefore should be and and when you look at the other comorbidities along with diabetes we uh, we uh, uh, i mean uh, we are aware that there are about 250 million people uh, with with hypertension a larger number of people with uh, obesity and and when you look at central obesity then the number even goes up to about 350 million people with with all these problems and and uh, diabetes hypertension and uh, obesity are probably uh, the the major factors which contribute towards the development of cardiovascular disease and and we know that we tend to have a disease burden which is which is different from that in the uh, in the western world we see that we tend to have diabetes and cardiovascular disease occurring at least a decade or two earlier in our uh, population and and we tend to have certain differences in terms of having these problems at at lower bmis and with the growing burden of obesity that is adding on to the to this uh, huge burden of uh, uh, problems that we are facing. So the, it is therefore imperative that we should focus our attention towards prevention. While we are providing the best care, we should also look at prevention. And uh, so I would like to start off with asking Dr. Santosh about what are his views on what are the initiatives being, being, uh, being carried out uh, both in the by the government and uh, by the uh, by the non-governmental organizations in terms of uh, in terms of these uh, addressing this uh, this huge burden of uh, non-communicable disease or metabolic problems that we are facing. Right. Thank you, uh, Professor Rakesh Sahai. I mean, first of all, a huge round of uh, applause and congratulations to IDEA for holding this year after year and in bringing back to our board how important prevention of uh, NCDC is. And also, you know, having this uh, topic of towards a healthier nation. So it's not just about treatment, but about prevention. Um, as a public health specialist, uh, our core, uh, you know, one of the most important Bhagavad Gita documents for us is the Family Health Surveys. And the National Family Health Survey 5 data speaks for itself, as you rightly said, that uh, the burden of disease is so huge. So if you look at the diabetes, uh, according to the All India figures, 17.9% of people in urban areas are having diabetes. 26.6% of the people are hypertensive. And uh, apart from this, Telangana has a very rich heritage of alcoholism, coupled with all of this, which is around 43.3% uh, in men. And uh, of course, women also, we score the highest of 6.7% of alcoholism. So if you look at the stats, it's huge. I mean, 26% of the population is hypertensive, and 18% is diabetic. Probably you have an intersection set somewhere around of 22, 23%. Now, and of adults who are above 15 years. So, government can do only a little bit. Now, if we look at the Indian health scenario, 70% of the outpatients come to private 
uh, clinicians and 30% of it goes to the public uh, clinics. Now if you look at the public hospitals, there has been a very aspirational uh, uh, you know, aim and objective that we want to set up NCD clinics, which is according to the NCPCDS, the vertical of the National Health Mission. But out of the 35 states, we could set up only in 24 states till now. NCD, state level, you know, resource center. And if you look at the districts, out of all the districts, we could set up only in 42% of the districts. And if you look at sub-district hospitals, PHCs, CHCs, we have been able to just touch 14%. So setting up or driving anything through public system itself has now reached somewhere around 14% at the primary level and around 40% at the district level or the medical colleges. So if you look at how much people we are able to serve, if you look at this, probably it is going, it's, it's very minuscule. We are not able to screen even 1% of the population which has the burden. So where do we screen the rest of the people? So I think a bigger chunk of this prevention needs to be taken up by corporate, private, single clinic, and also not-for-profits. All the people together, along with government system, needs to work on prevention. And without taking into picture each and every clinician and also every individual on board who is in the health system, NCDs cannot be prevented. It's not just a government system's job, but I think anyone who is a healthcare worker needs to be a part of the NCD prevention. Otherwise, this is going to be a very, very big phantom in the room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santosh, for highlighting the fact that, uh, you know, prevention is important. Prevention is very easy. Prevention is not that prevention is a very very difficult uh, aspect S prevention requires just education of the public about towards adopting healthier lifestyles and uh, you know screening early early screening and identifying problems early and uh, adopting a healthier lifestyle i think th those are the major uh, aspects about prevention but but i think uh, it is it is uh, as you have rightly highlighted that you know it's not just the government which can take care of all this and and it should be taken up by uh, by i mean it should be a public private partnership uh, everybody at every level should be looking at prevention and uh, you know uh, so to bring in that aspect i would like to you know, quickly get in Mr. Vikram and ask him to speak to us about, he's been running a chain of uh, chain of dialysis centers which has become very popular across the country and uh, they, they have been in a, a public-private partnership also and, and how they have scaled up to a huge scale. So I would ask, like to ask him two things. I would like to ask him to give us a quick brief, uh, this thing about his journey so far, how uh, he has, you know, how this was set up and also tell us whether you are looking at any preventive aspects in this because you know prevention is very important while you are providing dialysis services but you know you need to look at prevention it cannot uh, be that you can you know expand to an extent that you provide uh, keep providing dialysis so we need to look at preventive aspects so i would like to ask him uh, both these to address both these issues yeah. sure so my name is vikram uh, we started nephroplus about 15 years ago the co-founder is uh, himself on dialysis for the last 27 years and uh, he is the central theme of the company on how to make uh, lives of people on dialysis more normal, meaning more traveling, more working, more going out, just like normal people do. So Kamal has been instrumental, and we started in Hyderabad with the first outpatient standalone clinic. Uh, today, and then we kept on growing, kept on growing. We did six rounds of private equity. World Bank is a shareholder in uh, Nephroplus, Bessemer Venture Partners, Investcorp. Uh, today we run 450 dialysis clinics across 260 cities uh, in four countries. So it's been a phenomenal journey. Uh, I think very, very satisfying wherein you are transforming the uh, lives of these dialysis, people on dialysis. We do four PPPs, large PPPs in India, Karnataka, Andhra, uh, Uttarakhand, and Bihar. Uh, and we also do uh, serve PPP projects uh, in overseas markets like Philippines and Uzbekistan. And now we are, uh, this month we are entering Saudi Arabia. 
So it's, it, I think from a journey perspective, it's been phenomenal. We have been incredibly lucky, I would say, to keep uh, raising private equity and keep growing. Just put our heads down uh, and keep growing. But I honestly think that uh, uh, India does not have the money to take care of so many people on dialysis. India is 138 in per capita income. While on a GDP gross domestic product, you, we are the fifth largest. India is not an affluent country, 138th in per capita income. If many of these diabetics and hypertensive come into kidney disease funnel and then get into end stage renal disease, India does not have the money to pay for dialysis. And throughout the world, people on dialysis could only get government reimbursement because it's an incredibly expensive modality. So prevention is, is actually a no-brainer, it's essential. But I disagree with Dr. Santosh in terms of the government's role. Private service providers or any private firm will not do anything on prevention unless it becomes part of a for-profit project. The government, because it's going to look at the long-term benefits of the population, they have the best PR machinery, they have the best access to funds which will help in prevention. While the government should also push the private service providers to invest in prevention. What do I mean by that? For example, if it's a dialysis PPP in, let's say, state of Andhra Pradesh, the state of Andhra Pradesh should force the service providers who are delivering dialysis services to also bundle it with preventive services, do camps at, uh, as, at certain volume and certain frequency, identify people in early stages of kidney disease, to prevent them from getting into the end stage disease. But if you're expecting any service provider, any private firm to do it out of own um, uh, charitable behavior, it's not going to happen at scale. There will always be a few exceptions here and there, but it will never happen at scale. I believe government has a massive role to play, which it's not playing in India. And I see this overseas as well. It's nothing to do with India as a country but government has the massive role to play, firstly, in investing on its own, secondly, in forcing private service providers to create the projects or initiatives which private service providers have to be forced to deliver. No private service provider will deliver out of its own charitable behavior. I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. You highlighted the fact that uh, prevention is doable but needs to be, you know, uh, sort of directed by the government, channelizing all the resources from, you know, from the uh, NGOs and from uh, uh, private pu public private partnerships that they already have. And I think, uh, yeah, we'll discuss more about that. But uh, I would just like to bring in the important role of nutrition today in terms of, you know, cardi uh, in terms of causing these uh, NCDs. We know that uh, it is. Uh, uh, nutrition is a very important factor when looking at uh, the changing lifestyle and the changing nutrition uh, habits, I mean the eating habits of people that has probably contributed significantly to the growing burden of these problems, the growing burden of obesity and and uh, we are seeing childhood obesity also becoming very uh, prominent and we have a lot of data which has also uh, looked at, uh, you know, we have studies from Dr. Yajnik and his group that, that have looked at maternal nutrition and they have highlighted that and that is uh, also, you know, we are all aware of this concept of uh, developmental origins of adult diseases where we say that, you know, the maternal nutrition has a very significant impact on, on the, you know, offspring's uh, uh, development of uh, adult diseases which happen, the, uh, the cardiometabolic disorders. So we are very lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Hemlata, who is uh, who has been part of the uh, guide, I mean, she, she led the guidelines and they were recently released about uh, the nutritional aspects for, for Indians. And so I would like her to speak a little about that, tell us about what are these guidelines speaking about in terms of the maternal nutrition, how to improve the maternal nutrition during pregnancy and, and also about, you know, the, the various aspects of this guideline. Yeah. Uh, ICMA National Institute of Nutrition uh, has one of the important mandates of producing dietary guidelines for Indian. The first one was produced in 1998 and later in 2011. But the scientific evidences and the material that were available those times were different. In the last one decade, all of you know how our food systems have changed over the years. 
including the agriculture, the heating patterns, food habits, right from urban area cities to rural areas also it has changed a lot. If you go to any corner of tribal regions or villages, any remote place, you would easily find biscuits and many processed foods available, but freshly available, fresh vegetables and fruits will be hard to find and they'll also be very expensive. So in that context, although we know that uh, there is a clear association between dietary intakes and dietary intake plays a key role in as a determinant of health. However, there is no precise information on how much, what foods to be taken and how much uh, quantities to be taken to promote health and prevent NCTs. That way, the dietary guidelines of Indians have been produced and it was released on May 8th recently. It was developed over a period of two years. About 14 different uh, experts worked on it and we also took expertise from other parts of the country like uh, external experts also evaluated this. So this has very beautifully described all the uh, vulnerable age groups. It has covered right from fetal age to young children, infants, young children, across adulthood and old age also. And this, uh, the guidelines also include very beautifully what is unhealthy dietary practices, the meal frequencies, including what do you mean by unhealthy foods. So far, there is no definition in the country. Globally also, there is no proper definition of what is unhealthy food, but we dare to define what unhealthy diet means. So using this, the Food Safety Standard Authority of India also can come up with the regulations, appropriate regulations, and define and put uh, conditions to the food industries on how they should label foods. Because, uh, I mean, compared to the rest of the world, in India, the dietary habits are extremely poor. For that matter, 56.4% of the disease burden that we see in India is related to unhealthy dietary practice, practices. And you will be surprised to notice that even uh, smoking, alcohol consumption and air pollution come later uh, after di unhealthy dietary habits. So unhealthy dietary habits is quite common and the increasing epidemic proportions of diabetes type 2 and hypertension that we see is all mostly related to unhealthy dietary practices. If you follow a healthy dietary practice coupled with good physical activity which is, uh, I mean, lifestyle, uh, you can prevent almost all the lifestyle diseases including cardiovascular diseases, uh, stroke, heart attack and 80%, nearly 80% of diabetes type 2 can be prevented. So it's almost in our hands to prevent, uh, prevent these diseases and as pointed out by the earlier speakers, I would say that there should be a long-term commit, uh, commitment from different stakeholders, government, private, including the communities, individuals also, including the food industry as well. Unless all the stakeholders, different sectors, private and government, all of us come together, it is very, very difficult to resource, to come up with a strategy and pull out all the resources and infrastructure to prevent, uh, to improve the preventive health care in India. Right, uh, right now, at this point of time, preventive health care is extremely bad in India. Even the uh, National Program for Prevention of Diabetes, Cancer and all, they focus on screening and early diagnosis, but where is the strategy to prevent? Green. So we have a human scope to prevent uh, these diseases once we get into the community and once all the stakeholders come together and come up with a good strategy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think you have very, very rightly brought out several important points like, you know, the, that we don't have to focus on, on, on only the those who are screened and identified to have pre-diabetes, it's the general community which has to be, you know, they should be educated about the about the eating habits. And she also highlighted that 54% uh, of uh, the burden of, uh, I mean, uh, NCDs is contributed by by uh, by uh, unhealthy eating habits. And also, she also said that 80% of diabetes could be prevented by by just changing the dietary habits. So I think that's a very important aspect that have come out from the uh, from the uh, so that has been done and and the guidelines that have been uh, released i think uh, i would like to now take in the help of dr sarang they would understand you know she, uh, madam has also highlighted that there's need for getting everybody together getting uh, the government the non governmental agencies the individuals concerned and also you know getting everybody together and 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 seeing that uh, they understand this aspect i mean this importance of prevention so could you tell us something about you know how this could be done could you give us some insights into that. I'll try. 
Um, can I ask a few questions to the audience just to understand? Yeah, 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 yeah please. It's also getting close to lunch, so maybe some <laughs> some energy interaction will help. Uh, can I get a raise of hands? How many people here come from a medical or a clinical background? Not just doctors, but broadly clinical medical background. Almost everybody, I suppose. Excellent. Almost everybody. So, um, if there was any way that we could prevent all endocrinological disorders, prevent all of them, what would you think about that? From tomorrow, no endocrinology disorders whatsoever. Everyone well, will be very happy. Although it is, it is ideal, but I think it's a long way to reach that. I, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's, I mean, there's one response if we can, is, do we have time to get a response? Just, uh, very happy, and, and then retool yourself to do something else from day after? <laughs> That's what, what we have to know is we have to know how to control our body, mind, emotion, yeah. and energies, nothing else other than that. Fair, All fair. All others are different. Fair. Yeah. I think the point I was trying to make is, uh, while we may think prevention is easy, um, it actually is a very, very difficult problem, very wicked problem, uh, especially for people who are trained in a certain way to rectify problems. I mean, you, you guys are experts in rectifying very complicated problems. And so the thing that you're looking for is a problem. Right? I mean, we, we spent so many uh, panel discussions on all these algorithms, you know, the flowcharts, diagnostics. It's all to look for a problem and to remove or eliminate some problems, focus on someone else. Um, prevention, or if I take an extreme version, we are looking at health, right? Which is absence of any illness. And that's not a frame of mind that many of us are trained in. And so to me, um, the first point to keep in mind, and I'm using doctors or clinicians because they are at the center today, uh, is to probably recognize that the role that they can play in prevention is by seeking help from other allied health professionals. So in India, we have so many solo practitioners or small clinics with bare minimal skeletal support staff, right? So if I go back to the points that were being made, whether it is government's role or private sector's role, Private sector maybe has a role to play because 80% of healthcare in India is provided by private providers of some sort. But we also have to acknowledge that today they are not equipped to provide any sort of large spectrum of preventive care. One, because they are themselves not necessarily trained in that and we want them to focus on what they are good at, not on <coughs> prevention. So how can, we, how can we figure out building bigger teams, cross-functional teams, uh, that look at the patient in a holistic way. I mean, I was listening to some clinical discussion and I got only part of it, uh, but, but there was discussion about precocious uh, puberty and the first point being made was that you should counsel. If the doctor starts spending time on counseling, so while it is good to say counseling, and, and this is true for prevention, you got to look at a cross-disciplinary team. That's the one thing I want to make. Second is, um, there's a saying that says, don't fix something that is not broken, right? So all of us as individuals practice this. If I am not seeing any symptoms of diabetes or hypertension today, there's nothing to be fixed. So why should I do 10,000 steps? Why should I follow the food pyramid? So I think I agree that the onus is on individuals, but again, there's a lot of work on behavioral sciences. So here there's a lot of research done that shows how to nudge individuals, how to create societal or, or peer pressure to inculcate healthy practices, how do you create these communities. It's not going to happen automatically. A lot of this may seem common sense. Uh, it is of course common sense relative to the journal articles that get published in New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet or BMJ, but there is a separate science for all this. And so we will need entities that take on this science and convert it into practice of some sort, right? Now, going back to Vikram's point, which is very valid, I mean, he comes from University of Chicago, which is the, the bastion of capitalism. I'm not saying he is necessarily ascribing to all of that. Uh, but then the question is, who will undertake all these efforts? Why would individuals undertake these efforts? Second is, why would private players undertake these efforts? And so somewhere we got to find a way to make prevention as a good business, sustainable, right? 
and the entity that is unfortunately missing on the panel today but maybe is an important entity is uh, is IRDA uh, insurance sector is growing in India and uh, I'm sure within your practices larger and larger fraction of patient base comes as insurance patients right so they probably have a big role to play in saying what kind of health plans what kind of insurance product should we promote that help in better preventive uh, practices and outcomes um, we've now starting to see some signs of managed care i'm sure you've kept track narayana rudayala or nh narayana health has now floated uh, a managed care plan probably a step in the right direction but a lot to do so i'll i'll just stop here yeah thank you i think you have given us a, a, a little different perspective about understanding you know how you need to uh, drive this aspect, I mean, drive this awareness about prevention because people are aware, many of the things that we speak of, people may be aware of that, but they may not be implementing that and how we need to change their behavior into implementing that. And you also brought in the role of, uh, you know, in, uh, insurance because insurance today is covering only only things that are, that uh, you know, like managing a problem, managing a problem. That too when somebody is admitted into a hospital and not even um, looking at, uh, you know, reimbursing the outpatient care. So going into prevention would be a, a big step for that and I think that is, but that is a important area that we have to uh, look at and, and uh, that has to be. Uh, we'll have some uh, views from Dr. Sambasivayo who's, who's uh, into cancer care, you know, because that is again a area which, you know, where there's huge expenditure in terms of treatment, but prevention is possible. So let us hear from him what he has to say about, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, point, I mean, about what we're discussing. Now. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zaha and uh, Dr. Sham. Yeah, pleasure to be here with, uh, you know, enlightened and esteemed panelists. The healthier nation, it means that, you know, before developing a disease, so before a society walks into a hospital, how to detain and preserve and protect, that is the crux of the theme and the, uh, the slogan behind, you know, the prevention is better than cure, is immortal one, right? So, but very, you know, we have a, two great examples since independence of polio eradication and smallpox eradication. This being the virus induced responsible etiological factors, we developed vaccines. But the NCDs, a cluster of them, non-communicable chronic disease, disease are entirely a different ballgame. This requires not a unifocus, one movement. It requires both one from a capitalist from society and then the government. The capitalist world will not be interested in preventing the disease because there is no money in it. Capitalist is a money-oriented machine. I mean, you know, without, I mean, it has its own, so not, not going there. So, we need to have a robust a government and then some kind of an NGO merged streams with a long-term as well as short-term objectives and uh, interventions. The short-term interventions are like, you know, secondary prevention where you can screen the disease and pick them up and then prevent the long-term complications. The primary prevention would be the, the nip it off annihilate, negate the whole, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, genesis of the disease, of this sense. So for them, you require, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, you need to be alert, you need to uh, get, the, uh, get, get to the schools, youngsters, and train them, and you know, uh, um, enlighten them, give them awareness about these, these things, have the attitudes, that's where they pick up tobacco, so without realizing the, the tobacco related, it's not just cancer, it causes a plethora of diseases, yeah, all of them that. NCDs, right? So then the obesity, we used to, I mean, during our child, uh, childhood and schools, we used to have a physical activity, sports. Now these days only the vertical schools are there, they, they are called smart schools and e-schools, there is no exercise. There is now the obesity 
childhood obesity right and obesity is you know is a is an important etiological factor in the ncds including cancer some of them yeah and so therefore uh, uh, so thank continue. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll come back to Dr. Himlata, madam, for uh, for telling us something about these. Uh, I mean, you gave us very good insights about you know what what is the contribution of uh, bad nutrition or uh, bad eating, which is contributing to that. But could you tell us a few highlights of the guidelines that came out that you have released recently on on what is good. Uh, good eating habits and uh, just a summary of that so that we can take home some um, uh, some messages from that okay. and also i would then like to ask you what is what is being done by ni or icmr to uh, to percolate this message across the across the population and to see that you know we uh, two questions you have yeah right? yeah one is regarding awareness also many people have misconception that all of us are aware of what a uh, healthy diet means Actually, most of us do not know. Even those who are working in NI and 50% would not know what healthy dietary habits mean, actually. So here we have uh, laid out certain principles what healthy dietary habits mean. Like, for example, right proportion of cereals and pulses. If you know a cereal, I mean, if you take a diet, always it has to be accompanied with the pulses, appropriate proportion, that is 3 is to 1 we have made, to get good quality fiber and protein. And along with this, adequate quantities of vegetables. Every meal should be accompanied with vegetables and fruits to improve your micronutrient status and also increase your fiber. Now, if you think that you know everything about good, uh, good diet, how many of you would uh, how many of you know how much vegetables one has to take, minimum levels of vegetables to keep oneself healthy? Many of you may not be knowing and even if you know, many of you would be consuming hardly 150 to 200 grams of vegetables per day. I am telling the upper limit. But we have to consume minimum of 400 grams of vegetables per day to keep ourselves healthy. I am not saying people with diabetes. I am saying even if before you get diabetes and at least minimum of 100 grams of fruit. This has been shown by Cochrane reviews and 142 studies meta-analysis also showed consistently that single intervention of vegetables giving uh, uh, higher quantities of vegetables could prevent, it has reduced 25% relative risk of cardiovascular diseases and also certain cancers. So when there is so much evidence around the globe, we tend to ignore these evidences and do not follow uh, healthy diets. Coming to other principles like um, uh, you asked about pregnancy and uh, young children also. So in this guideline, uh, we have dared to say no sugar for children under two years. Because when this is followed by most of the other countries in the world, in India, all the uh, formula, baby food formula makers push a lot of sugar in the uh, formulas. Now it is time we wake up and see that our babies get right food and there is no sugar because sugar is a highly processed food which is not does not have any nutritive value except for calories at least they should not be exposed when they are very young even for adults it is harmful but at least under two children should not get any sugar so we have mentioned this in our guideline and during pregnancy for your information this is very important like we have this thousand days program uh, devised by our government of india um, from right from conception to two years of age of the child. But we from NI, we have devised a guideline how a woman before she enters into conception, before she gets pregnant, her health status and nutrition status should be optimal so that the growing baby uh, in the, the fetus has, uh, I mean, good nutrition and does not have higher risk of non-communicable diseases. Because the non-communicable diseases that we see in adult life is a cumulative effect of bad nutrition right from fetal age and young uh, infants, children and adulthood. So right from the age when you're, I mean, when you're, uh, I mean, the, when the baby is conceived, right from then, we need to have good nutrition. Why it is important to have a good preconception nutrition status is all the cells are rapidly multiplying. There is, there is hardly any time for the mother to cope up with the right nutrition. So unless she is properly nourished and healthy, she cannot give proper nutrition to the growing baby. So that way we have emphasized, given a lot of emphasis for preconception nutrition and young child feeding practices and have, we have given menus and all. And as I have already said, we have uh, dedicated a diet guideline totally on protein because protein has become a big myth and a, a fancy for many youngsters. Those who go to gym or do not go to gym, they want to take a lot of protein, which is not required and which can cause adverse health risks. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving us those uh, uh, insightful uh, points about the guideline that uh, has been developed. I think the most important thing is to to see that people are aware about this guideline and they are able to you know use it effectively. And I think uh, one of the ways is to use technology for 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 spreading the information on this guideline. Maybe you should develop an app which has that which everybody can have it on their phone because everybody has a cell phone now and they can probably use this they have so many apps uh, on their phone which may not be many of them may not be useful so i, I think if we develop an app from uh, from and uh, on this nutritional guidelines and that is good good for the general public more than those who are with the disease i think that can that can actually give us uh, more uh, uh, sort of uh, help in following a good eating habit dr santosh wants to say something i think he's uh, uh, going to tell us something about how he would propose that this guideline is is uh, is uh, disseminated to all the people and how we can change behavior we'll also ask dr sarang also how he feels that we could change behavior of people in terms of healthy eating and and uh, following a uh, active lifestyle so because ultimately those are the two things that can actually make a huge impact and uh, other thing i would like to also uh, uh, appreciate what madam has said about the sugar intake i think uh, being harm i mean one of the harmful effects of sugar in early life is probably it's very addictive also so apart from not providing any benefit it is very addictive and makes uh, makes people addicted to that i suppose yeah so i just wanted to give a disclaimer though, though my name is written there as member of national medical commission i don't belong to government and i belong to the private sector so I am a part-time member of NMC, representing the private sector. So uh, having said that, the other most important thing that I want to flag and what ma'am also has uh, very eloquently uh, uh, you know, raised, uh, we started a chain of uh, milk banks called Dhatri Mother's Milk Banks. Uh, now currently we are running 12 and we are going to start uh, 37 more this year. Exactly for the same reason is that uh, we need to have breast milk available for all newborn and infants. And uh, we run all these uh, milk banks in government hospital, especially uh, wherever we see formula feeds. That's where we are seeing a lot of childhood obesity, a lot of hypertension, diabetes early in early childhood. And uh, this is something which we are working on. And uh, another important thing that I want to flag, which even uh, um, Professor Sarang has raised, uh, about the behavioral change. Now, there is a very interesting book called Ikigai. I'm sure many of you would have read it. And uh, there's a very interesting study called the Okinawa study, where 600 octogenarians have been studied. I'm sure many of you know that. The five most important things that keep these people alive, healthy, and what Dr. Shyam was saying, the quality of life is very, should be very good, apart from being alive, is Five things. Number one, they have a very, very good, good social network. They have friends. They talk to each other. They meet every day. And it, it, re, it is really, really important. Second thing, all of them do farming till the last day. They are alive. They are very active. Third thing, they eat a lot of sushi, sushi and uh, fish. Fourth thing, they have green tea. And fifth, all of them in Okinawa, use chairs which are much, much lower than this. The height of the stool is this. So they sit down, they get up. So the proprioceptive and all those joints, everything are working well. So the point is, these five points are the key outcomes of the study. And this is what we really need to bring into the whole system. So it's not just the onus of one system or the other, but the larger community at uh, that we are going to. And in Singapore, for example, they have something called the National Health Promotion Board. I agree with Vic, uh, Mr. Vikram's point that government needs to take the ownership, but what can be driven is the industry, the uh, for-profit, the not-for-profit, driven by government's will, should actually drive something like a na National Health Promotion Board or something. And I am sure Hyderabad is a great place to set that up. Idea clinics can take a lead, ISB can promote, something where the intersection of data, for example, NCD clinics are doing testing, but all the data is being noted down on papers. We don't know what's happening, we don't know data, we don't have analysis. So the IT which is there in Hyderabad must be married to the clinical system 
that is there and then the industry must uh, come together with the government and then we need to set up something which does a lot of work on prevention which is again out of the box. We need to have marathons, we need to have cyclothons. Thank you. We have yeah. a lot of activity on that. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Santosh. I mean, you highlighted the importance of getting together people and also using technology to sort of drive this. So I would actually like to mention that, you know, many organizations like the RSSD, I'm, I'm the, currently the president of the RSSD. RSSD today is uh, having more than 12,000 members, which is more than what the ADA also has. So it is uh, probably the largest organization in the world dealing with healthcare professionals dealing with diabetes. And uh, we are you know, committed towards uh, towards improving awareness about diabetes and we have uh, have district coordinators in every district and we are adopting certain at least one or two villages in every district to sort of uh, uh, carry out these activities of uh, screening for diabetes and other NCDs and, and increasing the awareness and, and carrying out awareness activities. So this is how, you know, organizations like uh, professional organizations also could uh, contribute their bit and as you said, we should have a, 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 a single uh, I mean, sort of coordination between all these bodies and uh, somebody coordinating that and using information technology and and to that end I just wanted to also I'll, I mean, mention one fact that RSSD I'm realizing the importance of uh, technology in in improving health outcomes we have uh, partnered with uh, we have uh, set up a, a RSSDI Koita Center for Digital Diabetes in uh, in uh, IIT Bombay and uh, we are we are working with uh, you know to bring together technology and clinicians and all this to sort of uh, bring about you know change because there are so many apps available today so many things happening in the technology space but th that is all unregulated and nobody knows whether we knew which one to use and which one is going to really make a change in terms of the outcome so we are trying to sort of set up a a a, a, a sort of group which can uh, which can certify these apps and tell us tell people that okay this is what you can use and this is what is going to be good for uh, making making a difference in terms of the outcomes